Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. I will be moderating tonight. Andy will be Andy will be backing me up. I, our speaker for tonight will be Steve Schwarzenberg, candidate for U.S. Congress in the 5th Illinois District. Before I get into his detailed introduction, I want to remind everybody that there are two rules to the college. One is no personal attacks. Two is one fool at a time. The college will consist of the following format. One, we'll have a brief announcements period. Two, our speaker will speak. He's going to be doing two rounds of, uh, he's going to be doing a quick 10-minute stump speech and then taking a few questions after that. And he's going to get into the meat of his presentation with another round of Q&A. And then we'll take our, after that second round of Q&A, we'll then go into our infamous rebuttal period. Now, on this, Steve Schwarzenberg states there are essentially social democratic consensus in this country for a generation after the New Deal. I am running to help rebuild and improve that consensus, to be part of the nonviolent political revolution that Bernie Sanders has launched, and to encourage others to sign up as well. As Bernie says, enough is enough. The great nation and its government belong to all the people, not just a handful of billionaires. They're super PACs and they're lobbyists. I would add, we can't lose. I may or may not be elected, but this campaign will contribute to the movement to take back our economy from the 1%. Our speaker is ready. Let's give a rousing round of applause. Hi, I'm Steve Schwartzberg. And I'm running for Congress in the 5th District as a Bernie Sanders supporter. I've been a lifelong social democrat and I'm convinced that it's time for both a moral and a political revolution in this country. My training is as a diplomatic historian, Yale PhD 1996, a scholar of the history of American foreign relations who believes that we can draw from our common past to build a shared future. My favorite revolutionary among the founders of our country and the framers of our constitution is the Pennsylvania lawyer James Wilson. Years before Thomas Jefferson, Wilson had written, man is by nature equal and free. The American people, according to Wilson, we the American people are sovereigns without subjects. This was and is a succinct way of stating the most basic ideal of the American Revolution. It took the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement to even begin to make that true for African Americans. It took the suffragists and the women's rights movement to even begin to make that true for women. And it took the organization of trade unions and the trade union movement to even begin to help keep that true for working people, to help prevent the power of the state from being used on behalf of corporations to make subjects of workers. In our own day, it will take a moral and political revolution to prevent the 1% from making subjects of the rest of us and destroying the promise of the American Revolution. And it will take repentance on the part of the American people cease attempting to rule over the Indian nations as if they were in any way our subjects or subject to our jurisdiction. I think we have to begin with a vision of what kind of society we want to be. I believe we want to be a social democratic society, just, prosperous, ecologically sound, and self-governed by we the people. We are far from that now. 81% of American households experienced flat or falling incomes during the period from 2005 to 2014. Nearly half the Americans in the country, according to a recent Federal Reserve study couldn't cover an emergency expenditure of $400 because they have so little in savings. 90% of the kids born in 1940 wound up higher in the ranks of the income distribution than their parents. Barely 40% of those born in 1980 have done so. To some extent, this reflects the weakness of the American labor movement, which must be strengthened. But more fundamentally, it represents privileged treatment for the rich in the form of preferential tax cuts, preferential bailouts, and preferential access to credit generally. Privileged treatment that has led to a situation in which the income of the top 1% has gone from 10% of the total of the country in 1980 to 21% of the total of the country in 2015, more than double. This represents a concentration of wealth and power in our economy and our society that is ultimately incompatible with our democracy and that must be changed. I was looking for applause now. <laughs> Uh, you have to work this crowd. So, beyond restoring Eisenhower era top tax rates in order to make sure that the wealthy pay their fair share of the nation's taxes, we need to invest massively in our nation's infrastructure and in ensuring quality health care for all. 
programs of action that will benefit everyone in the country, including the rich, but which will especially benefit the poor, the working class, and the middle class. Now I have to remember what I was going to say. Um, all right. When one draws a blank, one pulls out one's notes. <laughs> Good. Ah, uh, yes. You can only say what he's allowed. It is high time for the United States to have a Marshall Plan again, a Marshall Plan yeah. for America. We helped rebuild Western Europe after World War II, and we can help rebuild ourselves. Our roads, our bridges, our railways, our water systems, our electrical grid are all in need of massive investment, and the world is in need of our decarbonizing our economy. When A. Philip Randolph first proposed the idea of a freedom budget in the 1960s, the idea of a budget that would seek to make progress towards social justice out of the proceeds of a growing economy and contribute to its further growth in turn, he did so with an eye toward the abolition of poverty in the United States within 10 years for all who were poor, regardless of ethnicity. I believe it is time for a freedom budget for the 21st century. I favor the principle of reparations for those who are descended from American slaves. And in particular, I favor H.R. 40 with its call to begin to investigate the issue. But my emphasis is primarily on support for a freedom budget for the 21st century. The ongoing injustice of racial economic inequality in this society forces us to recognize the tremendous gulf between the relative net worth uh, of white and black households, the median net worth of white and black households, $144,200 versus $11,200 in 2013, a more than tenfold difference. But if we are to persuade the American people to begin to address this, we must begin, I believe, by persuading them to help everybody in the country through investment in public education, investment in housing, investment in job training that will benefit all who are poor, regardless of their ethnicity. It is time for us to water the tree of economic growth at its roots instead of its top leaves. I began to get active politically, thank you. I began to get active politically in high school with a national organization called the Social Democrats USA, whose national chairman was the great civil rights organizer, Byron Rustin, the principal organizer of the 1963 March on Washington, at which King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. I learned a lot from Byron about the moral authority of nonviolence and about the importance of strategy. Above all, I learned from him that a movement that's fighting for justice fights for all or it's fighting for nobody, not even itself. Because we seek to stand in the center of progress toward democracy, we have what he called a terrifying responsibility to the society as a whole. I thought about a career in politics at the time, but in college I became more interested in academics. And for the past few decades, I've published work on both the good and the harm that America has done in the world in hopes of helping us do better. Perhaps the single greatest contribution that the United States ever made to the cause of democracy and social justice in another country was its support for the Japanese land reform after World War II. Instead of seeking revenge on those who had attacked us, we sought to make allies of the Japanese people as against the militarists who had betrayed them, as well as the people of the United States. My article on the subject, The Soft Peace Boys, Pre-Surrender Planning and Japanese Land Reform, is available online for free download. My book on the United States and the struggle for democracy in Latin America during the Truman years is available for purchase from the University Press of Florida or online from Amazon. Most recently, I finished a manuscript on the fight against Cherokee removal in the 1830s, the fight to try to prevent what became the trail of tears and death. We, the American people, are all in this together. As James Wilson wrote of the spirit behind American progress in 1790, all will receive from each, and each will receive from all, mutual support and assistance. Mutually supported and assisted, all may be carried to a degree of perfection hitherto unknown, perhaps hitherto not believed. It is high time to restore the hope-filled moral consensus on which our nation's progress rests, the consensus that was fought for by James Wilson, and Bayard Rustin, and Bernie Sanders, and countless others. It is time to transform our politics and our economics in order to take this country back from the 1% and serve the common good. If you support Medicare for all, if you support massive infrastructure and a Marshall, investment, Marshall Plan investment program for the United States, if you support a freedom budget to abolish poverty, if you believe in respecting the national sovereignty of the native peoples, if you want a foreign policy that is concerned with the global common good and that respects the rights and interests of others, then I ask you to please consider supporting my campaign. Thank you. Now a brief Q&A will follow for this part and then you'll go into your stump speech, Karan. A brief Q&A will follow and then I'll go into a handout, which is not a stump speech so much as an exploration of one of the basic issues that I'm campaigning on, the right of the native peoples to tribal sovereignty. And I'll be looking for your feedback on that 
One of the things that I think the Democratic Party needs to do, or that the progressive movement needs to do, is to articulate a simple series of themes again and again, and to campaign on those in election after election until we succeed. And one of the issues that's closest to my heart is respect for tribal sovereignty, and that's what I'll be talking about. Yeah. All right. You mentioned a green economy. Yes. On your website, how do you plan to achieve that? So I believe in following California's example on that to a certain extent, but I also believe beyond following California's example that we need to begin to withdraw as the renewables come online any support for the fossil fuel industry and then ultimately begin to tax that industry to drive it out of existence. So it's a two-tiered approach. If you look in California at the moment, California set as a goal half of renewable uh, energy by the year um, 2030. They're going to meet that 10 years early. <coughs> Uh, more than eight and a half times the number of jobs in renewables existed, sorry, more than eight and a half times the jobs in fossil fuels exist in renewables in California already. That represents that kind of level of commitment which California has made in a sustained way for years now is what the nation as a whole needs to do, but it needs to move beyond California as well. Okay. All right, it's questions for the first part. Pick some. Okay, well, you're. Uh, I, uh... Uh, you mentioned reparations. Yes. And um, I, I've been interested in that for a long time, and I'm wondering, uh, the only thing that bothers me about it is what form would reparations take? I mean, what? Tim, can you repeat so the question? The question is a question about reparations and what form would reparations take. And the answer to that question is very easy. I don't know, but that's why I support H.R. 40, which is a call to begin to study the question and to look into the ways in which the society as a whole might seek to make amends. Fundamentally, however, my emphasis is on a freedom budget for the 21st century that would benefit all who are poor, regardless of ethnicity. I believe that strategy, seeking to benefit everyone in the, in the country who is poor, is the best strategy for getting everybody on board. As I say, it's a matter of watering the tree of economic growth at its roots instead of the top leaves. Yes. Um, would you uh, help with the uh, some people in the Democratic Party that want to broaden the umbrella? so that they would support a uh, Democrat like Daniel Lipinski, yeah. who's against the ACA and is, is pro-life, pro unquote, and all of those things. What would you do about that, if, or would you support that? So there's an article on my uh, webpage, a newsletter, on resolving the left-liberal divide. And here is where I would say we need critical loyalty in the general election, and we need vigorous contestation in the primary election. So I believe as a Bernie Sanders supporter that Bernie Sanders people should be out there running in every primary against anyone who doesn't stand for the people's agenda that our revolution has articulated. But in the general election, I will support a Democrat, a moderate Democrat is against a Republican. Where do you find it on your website? Where do I find it on the website? If you go to uh, speeches and newsletters and speeches on the website okay. and uh, scroll down newsletters, you'll find a newsletter on resolving the left liberal divide. Yes, yeah, for I'm, I'm there already. All right. Question in the back. Uh, I have a two part question. Okay. Uh, the, um, Thank you, so uh, What's your background? Briefly, I didn't see, look at your website. So, I'm a PhD in diplomatic in history from Yale. And work background. Wow. And then the second part question is what's the problem with Quigley? Or what are his faults? Okay, so I'm not, I'm not interested in running against Quigley, although I could list some faults and areas where I disagree with him, the most important of which is his failure to endorse Medicare for all, for, to endorse HR 676. But fundamentally, I'm running to offer Bernie's program and platform. I worked for Bernie in the fall, in the, the beginning in January of 2016. I went out to Iowa and canvassed door to door for him. I went to Wisconsin and canvassed door to door for him. I support everything that he has articulated in terms of programs and policies, and that's what I want to offer the people of the fifth district who supported Bernie. By the way, he carried the district, the chance to support in Washington. So, in terms of my own background, I mean, there's an about the candidate section of the webpage if you want more information about me. But my fancy credential is that I got a Yale PhD. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, the, the incumbent is reported to be a good dancer, and that there are, are uh, four candidates splitting the votes of those who don't want to vote for them. So, uh, that's always the problem when you've got multiple candidates, is you don't know how things are going to split. I don't know what voters will take the opportunity to back a Bernie candidate as against backing any of the other candidates in the race. Uh, but I am, as far as I know, the only candidate who went out and actively campaigned for Bernie in the primaries. 
the only candidate who has uh, articulated the Our Revolution People's Agenda, uh, the candidate who has most clearly offered himself as a, a social democratic alternative for the voters. So I'm hoping that people will rally around that. Yeah. Will you hold our media accountable for failing to inform we the people about the Republican Party's extreme lies about the outcomes of their tax plan? Uh, to the extent of my ability, yes. I think fundamentally this raises the question of how we deal as a people with a corrupt uh, media establishment. Uh, I think Bernie Sanders' effort to have a, a town hall meeting on Medicare for All is a step in the right direction. What I'm hoping to do here tonight is something similar to that around the issue of um, respect for tribal sovereignty. So I think if we can go through the basic issues that matter in this campaign and that matter to the country, each district at a time, in town hall meetings, and, and people who are wanting to be your representative going out there and talking with you and getting feedback from you about what you care about, that we can build a consensus in this country around a set of principles and a set of programs that will enable us ultimately, if we win successive elections, to implement those programs and principles. Uh, but that is the, the hard work that is ahead of us. I, I don't have any illusions about this being something, something that can be done overnight or done by me alone. It will take a large number of people in a large number of districts, and above all, it will take grassroots activism. Thank you. Okay. There's a movement afoot to uh, gain full employment through uh, rebuilding our infrastructure. I'm wondering how you would address that and how you would fund it. Okay, so in terms of uh, addressing it, the United States spends currently about 0.6% of its GDP on infrastructure. At its peak in uh, the New Deal era, you know, the era of the Civilian Conservation Corps and the Works Progress Administration, the United States was spending about 3% of its GDP. Even during the Carter years, we were up at about 2% of GDP at a time when we were building and rebuilding a lot of water systems as well as there was a highway build out. So fundamentally, the question is whether we're going to accept continual deferred maintenance with all of the costs of deferred maintenance. You know, that is the most severe tax that one can place on the American people, is the tax of deferred maintenance, the tax of doing nothing. Or whether we're going to invest in our nation's infrastructure and our nation's future. Now, there are a lot of ways in which this could be paid for. It could be paid by a mixture of taxes and borrowing. I happen to favor a, mo a massive bond issue, a Rebuild America bond issue, in order to finance the infra infrastructure investment we need. But fundamentally, how it's financed is less important than the fact that it needs to be financed. If you look at, uh, for example, barges, uh, our, our, our system of shipping locks, if you have a barge stopped on the upper Mississippi, what happens? It sits there and it waits, and waiting is tremendously expensive. The delays in our economy that are caused from waiting on our shipping locks is phenomenal. It's 14% of the nation's transport, and the increase in delays has been threefold in the last 15 years. 80% of the locks uh, in the country experienced a malfunction in 2016. Half of them are older than their 50-year life expectancy. This is just illustrative of one component of our infrastructure that is breaking down and desperately needs to be fixed. If we can remove the delay time in our economy that's caused by poor infrastructure, we can increase our productivity and with it our economic growth. We can also pay for our, our, our infrastructure investment out of the proceeds of the economic growth to which it will contribute. And how much do you think that's going to cost? So at, at the peak of the New Deal, if you were talking about it as 3% of GDP, uh, that would come out at about $600 uh, billion dollars for its peak year, and I would say after that about $200 billion a year for 10 years. So we're talking $2 trillion. If you want a, if you want a relative way to think about that money, <coughs> the size of the increase in the wealth of the 1%, the size of the increase in the take-home income of the 1% from 1980, to 2015 is to go from 10% of GDP to more than 20% of GDP. Now, 10% of GDP is about $2 trillion these days. That would pay for the infrastructure investment we need. That is to say, the 1% the could keep their 10% of the nation's income that they had in 1980, and if they were paying, paying a fair tax rate, we would have enough money from that tax alone to pay for the infrastructure we need. Why did they do that? Thank you. Um, real yeah. quick. What do you think of the text of H.R. 1407? The text of H.R. 1407, I don't remember. Uh, that's the uh, National Rare Earth Metals and uh, Thorium Act. Okay, yeah. and what is the purpose I'll, of the question? I'll, I'll take it off mic. I don't have, have uh, a handle on the National Rare Earths and Thorium Act. Okay, I'll, I'll come to you later on on that. Okay. So, are there, there's another question in the back? No, there are more questions. Okay, all the way in the back. Charles? 
Uh, yes, sir. I'm with the public transit citizens group, Citizens Taking Action. And what existing public transit in the fifth district would you improve upon uh, if elected? What would I include upon? Improve. Improve upon. I think our public transit systems throughout the country need in infrastructure investment. So I would seek to improve on all of them, but what we can actually negotiate in the way of a package agreement through the Congress, that remains to be seen. But the goal would be to improve public transit in all of our urban areas. Because in all of our urban areas, if we're interested in decarbonizing our economy, if we're interested in moving to a green economy, we have to invest in systems that move people more efficiently and with less carbon footprints, and mass transit systems are exactly those systems. Uh, have you given any consideration to taking maybe $500 billion a year out of the bloated defense budget and started spending it on... <laughs> so here, here's an answer that I'll push back on that. I think our, our defense budget is bloated and should be smaller. i got no problem with that. But I think it's a strategic and tactical mistake to say, oh, we can afford this if we take it from the defense budget. I think we should argue for what we need for defense and argue for what we need for the rest of the social programs of the country on the basis of what will serve the country's interests. So regardless of what we're spending on defense, I want massive infrastructure investment, I want Medicare for all, I want a freedom budget to abolish poverty in the country in 10 years. Those things can pay for themselves. And so I don't, I don't accept the, the premise of the question that we have to have a trade-off between guns and butter. I agree that we have a ridiculously inflated uh, defense department budget, but I don't want to be in the position of saying to people, you have to agree to cut the defense budget in order to support Medicare for all, or in order to support a freedom budget, or in order to support a Marshall Plan of uh, investment in our nation's infrastructure. As a follow-up, then, how yeah. would you, uh, you know, address the cancerous defense budget that's bleeding our country dry at a trillion dollars a year. Right, so then the question is, what do we need in the way of a defense budget? Why do we have such an overly uh, exaggerated defense budget? And that gets into the question of the fear and hate that's been cultivated in this country since 9-11. Right. And that's how I would address it. If you go to my webpage, if you go to the essay uh, that I put together there on providing for the common defense, I talk about what the challenges are that the United States faces in the world and how to address those challenges. And I spend a lot of time talking about the United States' relationship with China, which is, I think, the most important bilateral relationship that the country has going into the 21st century and how essential it is for us to understand where the Chinese people have come from and where they are going to in terms of their own traditions and their own culture. And I try and present that as I did a minor field in Chinese history in graduate school in a sympathetic way and to say the United States needs to be thinking about how to reach out to people on the basis of common interests and on the basis of common values because although China is an authoritarian dictatorship with which we have significant differences, there are also common values there that can be cultivated. Instead of that, the tendency has been to focus on, say, the South China Sea or cyber warfare and to hype up a lot of fear and hate. Fundamentally, what this country needs is a greater dose of courage. It needs a greater sense of FDR's position that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And that's the best answer to the, the bloated military budget that we have, is to stop being so afraid. Okay. Yeah, question all the way in the back. Um, Would you be in favor of a multilateral global initiative to cut all defense budgets and hands? Absolutely and put that money towards infrastructure? I, I, again, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say put that money, to, I, I would just say it's worth doing on its own terms. I wouldn't say take this money here and we'll do it here because somebody else is going to come to you and say, well, I don't want to take this money there. I want it for the military. Fine. You want it for the military? You advocate that. You push it in Congress. I'll vote against you. That's what my commitment is. But fundamentally, the people of this country as a whole have a right to Medicare for all, have a right to massive infrastructure investment, have a right to a freedom budget to abolish poverty. That's what we should be pushing for because it's right and because it's in our interest and because we can afford it and indeed we can't afford not to do it. So you're in favor of a multilateral cutting? I am I'm in favor of an arms control agreement that would seek to reduce the expenditures that all nations spend on defense as a percentage of their GDP, definitely. How are we going to fight North Korea? I don't think fighting North Korea is in any way, shape, or form a good idea. Okay. Fundamentally, if you think the war in Iraq was difficult, the war that would, would be launched in North Korea, if we were stupid enough to launch it, would make Iraq look like a picnic and a cakewalk. It's a million-man army. It's heavily armed. The, the casualties, the deaths in the first few days from civilian weaponry alone, even if nuclear weapons were not used, and there's no guarantee they wouldn't be, would be in the tens of thousands. It would be the height of irresponsible stupidity to go to war with North Korea. 
All right. Um, got one here and then. Okay, sorry. Uh, second. Sorry. Uh, two things. Um, what would you do to save the post office? And the other thing is, uh, we keep hearing about Social Security kind of uh, never really going away, but not being properly funded. Like, how would you address those two things? Okay, let me take the, the second one first, and, and, and then I'll go for the first one second. So the question is on Social Security. There is a cap on the taxable income that currently sustains Social Security of $127,200, if I remember rightly. I would remove that cap, which would provide funds for an expansion of Social Security. This is something that Bernie Sanders has talked about. It would improve the liquidity of uh, Social Security going many decades into the future. It's what we should do. We should push back against this Republican narrative that we can't afford to provide decent care for our elderly in the elderly years of their lives. So the second part of your question is the post office. Here again, the post office has been strangled by Republican initiative because they hate it, because they hate a public sector that's doing well and doing good for the country. We need to defend it and to vote to, to increase funding for it. And if I can get rid of that. She's got one. Uh, and get rid of the requirement that, that pensions have to be paid for in advance before an employee yeah. has even been hired. Yes. Um, I'm interested in the, in the idea of uh, evaluating things on their own merits um, because there, there's been a, a really interesting thing in the, in the Illinois legislature about energy where um, we were blackmailed into bailing out uh, the nuclear plants to the tune of $3.2 billion, $2.3 billion dollars yeah. for 10 years and that was blackmail um, because people wanted what was in the rest of it, which was a green economy. And it erased the green economy, that mm -hmm. huge bill. And then uh, Trump has just said, OK, you can have DACA if you'll give me the wall. And it, it's some kind of um, bargaining where things are not evaluated on their own merits, but, but you're blackmailed into doing what you, getting what you need because somebody with power will trade it for something they want. I think blackmail is the right word for it. I would say Trump is a hostage taker. He's taken the dreamers hostage, and he's threatening them with truly horrible treatment. And I believe that you negotiate with hostage takers. I don't believe you try and uh, do anything else with them. So fundamentally, I would be willing to pay the price, horrible as it is, of the wall to protect the dreamers. I think once we get back into uh, power, yeah. See, once we get back into power, I think we need to have a, a, a legislation that develops a swift path to citizenship for all the undocumented immigrants in this country, not merely the dreamers. But we are in a situation where a lot of lives are on the line. This is a hostage taker who has shown that he is devoid of, of human decency and would be certainly willing to turn people loose uh, on, on these individuals, these dreamers, and throw them out of the country, and that's completely unacceptable. Okay. Uh, do you want to get back to your presentation? Yeah, and if people are willing, uh, some of my friends at this table will, will circulate my handout and we'll get into this uh, this next section of, of the presentation. Let's thank him first for his first section. Yeah, and let's get the handouts out and uh, let's get into our second section. One question while you're doing yeah. it, can you give us a little bit more? I know you've hinted at it, but a little bit more about your personal background while the handouts are going out. Sure, uh, a little bit more about my personal background. So I can tell a story that will be hair raising in this while the handouts are going out. Um, uh, my background uh, as an academic was uh, relatively short lived. I had a series of one year appointments, never uh, received tenure in the academic world. I taught at UNLV, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas for a couple of years, and then went to Yale to become the director of undergraduate studies for international studies for two years. Uh, it was initially a one-year appointment. It was renewed for a second year. In the middle of my first semester, a student in the major was murdered, and I came to suspect a colleague of the crime. Instead of keeping my mouth shut, I went public with my suspicions, which alienated me from not only that colleague, but from the school. As I say, Yale, to its credit, renewed my contract for a second year after that, but it did not renew it for a third year. Unemployed, I became profoundly depressed. At the low point in my life, I jumped in front of a subway train, which is how I lost my hand. I don't recommend that course of action to others, but for me, it was an extraordinary blessing. I felt God's love and the miracle of being alive, and I haven't felt depressed since. I spent the next uh, few years in a mental hospital, came out of it, and returned to Chicago in 2008. 
In 2010, I was hired as building office manager at Church of Our Savior in Chicago, the Episcopal Church in Lincoln Park, which is one of the two parishes that I belong to. I was building office manager at Church of Our Savior until I decided to run for Congress. Are, are you married or any children? Divorced, and I have two kids. Okay, just curious. Yeah, and, no problem. Question right. in the back. Uh, yeah, um, like Margaret Thatcher took away a lot of the rights that they had under social democracy in, the, in England, and what do you think the reason for that? Okay, so here I think we on the left, I'll be presumptuous to assume everybody in the room is on the left, <laughs> have failed to speak from first principles. We took for granted the accomplishments of the New Deal. We took for granted the progress we made in the Civil Rights Movement. And we didn't continually push the edge of the envelope forward on the basis of what first principles should be. And so we had a rise of conservatives, or reactionaries, I would call them, rather than conservatives, coming forward and arguing from first principles and making political hay of it. So let me give you an example. Uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1864 says, the legitimate object of government is to do for a people all the things that they need to have done that they cannot do themselves or cannot do so well in their individual and private capacities. I think that statement is very much uh, an accurate statement of the legitimate role of government. But Ronald Reagan comes into office in 1981 and he says, government is not the solution to the problem, government is the problem. And there isn't an effective response to that, and there is still not an effective response to that yet, except for the response that Bernie Sanders has started to make in the political revolution that he started to launch. And by political revolution, I mean returning to first principles, returning to the principles that founded this country, and the, the more full realization of those ideals that have been brought about by social movements struggling for justice from generation to generation ever since the founding. We've had a, a reactionary movement between, since Reagan and Thatcher in the world as a whole. There's been a reactionary movement, and there hasn't been pushback against its presuppositions, against its basic arguments, and there needs to be. Okay, seeing as everybody hands your hand out, let's get into the uh, okay. second part of your presentation, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. <coughs> so I'm open, open to your suggestions as to how best to proceed in this. What I think I want to do is to read you the first page of this handout. You can read along with me. And then as we go into it, get into a discussion on each of the different aspects of the argument. Um, before I do that, let me ask, just take a quick poll. How many people here are sympathetic to the idea of respecting the tribal sovereignty of the native peoples? The what? Respecting the tribal sovereignty of the native peoples. Okay, now how many people feel like they could define tribal sovereignty in American law, where it comes from, what it is? Okay? By the end of this presentation, you will be able to do that. So, um, if there is to be meaningful repentance on the part of the American people for our ongoing unethical conduct toward the Indian nations, it must begin with the determination to keep our word to the tribes as we have given it in the treaties we have made with them. This means recognizing that under the Constitution, as the framers intended it, as well as under international law, the tribes have all the rights of foreign states, including the right to sue states of the United States in the Supreme Court for violations of their treaty rights. This means reopening a treaty-making process with the native peoples, governing our relations with them in accordance with treaties, and, and ceasing any attempt to rule over them as if they were in any way our subjects or subject to our jurisdiction. We must overturn the Supreme Court's mistaken decision in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia in 1831 a decision that paved the way for the American version of ethnic cleansing that came, known, came to be known as the Trail of Tears and Death, and for countless subsequent injustices and brutalities. For the framers of our Constitution, treaties with the Indian tribes were the same as treaties with any other foreign power. In the words of Article Six of the Constitution, all treaties made, or which shall be made, under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. James Wilson, the same guy I quoted earlier, uh, who had served on the Committee of Detail in the Constitutional Convention, defended this language in the Pennsylvania Ratifying Convention in 1787. This clause, sir, will show the world that we make the faith of treaties a constitutional part of the character of the United States, that we secure its performance no longer nominally, for the judges of the United States will be enabled to carry it into effect let the legislators of the different states do what they may. 
the opponents of American ethnic cleansing in the 1830s, and there were a lot of them in this country, it was a close run fight. The final vote in the House of Representatives in 1830 was 102 to 97. If you could have swung three votes, you would have the beginning of a different outcome, potentially. So the opponents of American ethnic cleansing noted the reasons why the rights of the native people should be respected. Dismissing any claim that Indian rights could be denied because the Indians were savages, Rhode Island Senator Asher Robbins asked in 1830, is the Indian right less a right because the Indian is a savage? Or does our civilization give us a title to his right, a right which he inherits equally with us from the gift of nature and of nature's God? The Indian is a man and has all the rights of man. The same God who made us made him and endowed him with the same rights. For of one blood if he made all the men who dwell upon the earth. Or as the activist Jeremiah Everts argued in 1830, the people of the United States are bound to regard the Cherokees and other Indians as men, as human beings entitled to receive the same treatment as Englishmen, Frenchmen, or ourselves would be entitled to receive in the same circumstances. Here is the only weak piece in their cause. They are not treated as men, and if they are finally ejected from their patrimonial inheritance by arbitrary and unrighteous power, the people of the United States will be impeached and condemned for treating the Indians not as men, but as animals. To this day, the Native people's right to equality under the law has yet to be respected. So the short answer to the question of where tribal sovereignty comes from is that the Native peoples always had tribal sovereignty. They always had national sovereignty. We broke our treaties with them. We broke our own constitutional law. And we came up with this fiction in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia that the Indian tribes were domestic dependent nations and not foreign states. And in the rest of the presentation, I'll go into how that happened. But fundamentally, what the, what the Supreme Court claimed in 1831 and 1832 was that the Indian nations retained some sort of residual sovereignty, enough to be respected when it came to a conflict with a state like Georgia, but not enough to actually be able to sue a state for violations of their treaty rights in the United States uh, Supreme Court. That's, that's the key mistaken decision, and all sorts of horrors follow from that. The horror of the Trail of Tears and Death follows from that. The horror of the theft of the Black Hills falls from that. The horror of the Dawes Act falls from that. Uh, the horror of the termination policy uh, in the middle 20th century follows from that. All of these uh, follow from that basic legal mistake that was made by John Marshall. I want to talk now about how that mistake came to be made. Uh, before I, I get into that piece of it, let me talk about a quote from the dissent in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, which I encourage people to read, because that dissent lays out what the law is and what it should have been recognized by the court as being. And where is the authority, either in the Constitution or in the practice of the government, as Supreme Court Associate Justice Smith Thompson and Joseph Story argued in their dissenting opinion in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, for making any distinction between treaties made with the Indian nations and any other foreign power? In other words, does your word mean anything? You've made a treaty. You've signed a treaty. What are the consequences of that? Are you bound by your word? We gave our word to the native peoples in treaty after treaty, and beginning in 1831, we formally declared that our word doesn't really mean what our word was supposed to mean. Uh, that the Cherokees constituted a foreign state with treaty rights that the United States was obliged to respect was a position eloquently maintained by the opponents of removal, such as Congressman Henry Storrs in New York in 1830, who argued that the good faith behind generations of treaties was at stake. The bad faith of the advocates of removal was similarly on display. Thus, according to Georgia Senator John Forsyth in 1830, a contract made with a petty dependent tribe of half-starved Indians could not be properly dignified with a name and claim the imposing character of a treaty. <coughs> the contrast between Forsyth's position and that of the American government to that time is striking. That all foreign state was to the framers of the Constitution was another state possessing dominion, and that the Indian tribes qualified as such is clear from George Washington's successful appeal to the Senate of the United States in 1789 to establish the practice of ratifying treaties with the Indian nations. It doubtless is important that all treaties and compacts formed by the United States with other nations, whether civilized or not, should be made with caution and executed with fidelity. That was the position at the time of the founding. That was the position in 1789. That was the position that was repudiated by the Supreme Court in 1831. It started with Georgia, with the state of Georgia, pursuing a fanatic vision of states' rights. In the late 1820s, acting on contempt for the native peoples, greed for their land, and a fanatic belief in states' rights, the legislature of Georgia illegally sought to extend its jurisdiction over the Cherokee Nation. 
and be it further enacted, one Georgia law of 1829 read, that after the first day of June next, all laws, ordinances, orders, and regulations of any kind, whatever, made, passed, or enacted by the Cherokee Indians, either in general council, or in any way whatever, or by any authority whatever of the tribe, be in the same, are hereby declared to be null and void and of no effect, as if the same had never existed. Now, as late as March 25th, 1825, the governor of Georgia had issued a proclamation warning that state citizens from trespassing on Indian lands, as the obligations of treaties that were the supreme law prohibited such trespass. Four years later, these Georgians managed to convince themselves that a non-existent conquest and a fictitious discovery were somehow superior to the supreme law because the state was allegedly sovereign, with states' rights that the Constitution allegedly could not supersede. Georgia was threatening to tear the Union apart in its desire to take Cherokee land. And John Marshall, faced with that threat, blinked and appeased the state's rights fanatics. Ignoring the Treaty of Holston in 1791 when the issue reached the Supreme Court, a treaty in which the United States pledged to solemnly guarantee to the Cherokee Nation all their lands, Chief Justice John Marshall conflated the geographical with the political meaning of the word foreign in his opinion. Marshall argued that the Indian tribes, although certainly states, were not foreign to the United States and hence not foreign states, but were instead domestic dependent nations and so did not have standing to sue the state of Georgia for its violations of their treaty rights. This is the heart of Ms. Marshall's mistaken position. We perceive plainly that the Constitution in this article does not comprehend Indian tribes in the general term foreign nations, not we presume because a tribe may not be a nation, but because it is not foreign to the United States. Marshall claimed in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia that when the term foreign state is introduced in the Constitution, we cannot impute to the Constitutional Convention the intention to comprehend Indian tribes within it unless the context forced that construction upon us. We find nothing in the context and nothing in the subject of the article which leads to it. In fact, a moment's reflection on why the framers granted foreign states the right to sue states of the United States will suffice to force precisely that construction. The intention was to improve the faith and credit that foreign nations could place in the United States to keep its word. It was a matter of virtue, honor, and a self-interest centering on the establishment of a new mechanism with which to contribute to prosperity and to the maintenance of peace by upholding established agreements and resolving international controversies through the American judiciary. For the framers, all of the treaties the United States made were part of the supreme law of the land. The framers had no reason to doubt that the Indian tribes were foreign nations with whom the United States had entered into legally binding treaties and would never have sought to escape their obligations with a novel and fictitious phrase such as domestic dependent nations. Deprived of the protection that the, of the law that Marshall's, by Marshall's sleight of hand with the word foreign, the Cherokee Nation was coerced into a fraudulent treaty in 1835 that former President John Quincy Adams called an eternal disgrace upon the country. The overwhelming majority of the Cherokee people were then coerced onto a forced march, as most of their Native American neighbors already had been, to what would eventually become Oklahoma. The departure of 13,149 Cherokees was noted by the Cherokee principal chief in the fall of 1838. Arrivals in Indian territory as counted by an American official there came to 11,504. The difference, the lower end estimate of 1,645 who did not survive the journey does not include those who died in American concentration camps in the summer of 1838 or those who died among the groups removed earlier by the army. Those who survived among those groups may even be part of the total of 11,504. This horror took place because of the Supreme Court's failure to uphold the law. It was the prelude to many subsequent horrors from the theft of the Black Hills to the Dawes Act to the termination policy of the mid-20th century. It is remarkable that American conduct can be met with a compassionate attitude conveyed in the following comment from the Cherokee jurist Steve Russell, who after noting that an almost bottomless well of collective guilt keeps the modern beneficiaries of genocide from finishing the job, later writes, we know the colonists could not now go home if they were so disposed. Our lot is intertwined with the colonists as black South Africans are with the British and the Dutch. They have nowhere to go. While they have not historically been the best of neighbors, they are still our neighbors, and we must do our best to civilize them. The Supreme Court's mistaken decision in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia must be overturned either by recognition on the part of the Supreme Court that it was mistaken or by constitutional amendment. There is no other way to respect the rights of the tribes to equality under the law. Such an amendment might read as follows. The Indian tribes are sovereign nations with all the rights of foreign states. 
The Indian tribes have the right to sue states of the United States and the United States itself in the Supreme Court for any violation of their treaty rights. The United States shall govern its relations with the Indian nations in accordance with treaties it has made or will make with them. The Supreme Court, in seeking to adjudicate disputes, will do so in accordance with these treaties. The United States shall reopen a treaty-making process with the Indian tribes and with any confederation of these tribes for as long as the tribes so desire. There is no better way to address the foundations of the extreme injustice that has marked relations with the native people since 1831, but even before. As recently as 1978, in United States v. Wheeler, the Supreme Court went so far as to claim that the sovereignty that the Indian tribes retain exists only at the sufferance of Congress and is subject to complete defeasance. This absurd position must be repudiated. Any small d Democrat repudiates the Supreme Court's decision in Dred Scott v. Stanford in 1857, holding that a free Negro of the African race whose ancestors were brought to this country and sold as slaves is not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States. The same repudiation should be directed toward the Supreme Court's decision in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, holding that the Cherokee Nation is not a foreign state in the sense in which the term foreign state is used in the Constitution of the United States, and this for much the same reason. Both decisions violate basic notions of equality and fairness that are intrinsic to America's deepest understanding of the country's constitution and purposes. In both decisions, there was an attempt to change the meaning of a previously more exclusive term, inclusive term, excuse me, foreign state or citizen, and on spurious grounds denied its applicability to those deemed inferior in an effort to deprive them of their constitutional rights. The Supreme Court's failure to respect the sovereign equality of the Indian nations runs through every decision the court has made since 1831 on what the American Bar Association refers to as federal Indian law. Federal Indian law, whose law is it? Not the law of the Native Americans, the law imposed on the Native Americans by the United States. But some decisions are obviously worse than others. Steve Russell in his book, Sequoia Rising, lists many cases that require no more than common sense and an instinct for right and wrong to believe should be reversed and which might easily be corrected by the Congress. In 1978, in Oliphant versus Squamish Indian tribe, the court took away the right of tribal courts to hear misdemeanors involving white people on Indian land. In 1989, in Cotton Petroleum Corporation versus New Mexico, the Supreme Court allowed states to tax what little the tribes have left by imposing a state severance tax on minerals removed from tribal land. In 2005, in City of Sherrill versus Oneida Indian Nation, the Supreme Court held that Indian tribes cannot regain sovereignty over lands they once held by purchasing those lands on the open market. All of these decisions should be corrected. The American people are meant to be what James Wilson called sovereigns without subjects. Just as we must prevent the 1% from making subjects of the rest of us, we, the American people, must cease attempting to rule over the native peoples as if they were in any way our subjects or subject to our jurisdiction. We must pursue equality under the law for all the citizens of our country and respect the sovereign equality of every nation in the world under what Senator Asher Robbins called the gift of nature and of nature's God. Okay. Questions? All right. Will Indian sovereignty include the ability to take the price off the excise taxes on cigarettes so that they can uh, get... Of course. Uh, they're sovereign nations. We, we would negotiate with them. We would find treaties uh, to deal with any issue that we hope to deal with, and assuming we could find common ground with them, and I, I think probably we could. And so one of the questions would be what duties would be for good traveling back and forth across national boundaries. So they could set up customs and... They, they have all of the rights, as I interpret the law, of foreign states under our law. Now, the rights of foreign states under our law are not well specified by the Constitution. It's clear under the Constitution that a foreign state has the right to sue a state of the United States for violations of its treaty rights. It's not clear what other rights it has. Okay. Question about Charles. Yeah, and he... 1767, I believe the Quebec Act was passed, giving all the land to the United States west of the Appalachian Mountains to the Mississippi to the Indians and the French too. And in turn, the Indians fought, joined with the British and fought against the Colonials yep. in the American Revolution. Yep. And Washington so had to send an army. They had to send in a major army that they needed elsewhere, Washington, in response to what the Indians were doing. Now, I'm not saying the Indians, I don't believe they were punished, 
and it in respect at the conclusion of the war, but this war was fought, and they took a side. They, they could have not done anything. So let, they let, let's They actively chose to fight against the United States. Now you show up, and am I correct? You're demanding things of the people you just fought against? So here, let me clarify the situation for you. First of all, there were divisions among the native peoples. There were some like the Stockbridge Indians who fought on the American side in the Revolutionary War. We should remember that there were divisions and not simplify the history. Second, we should remember that that history was closed by treaties. Right? The claim that the United States conquered the native peoples is a false claim. They we closed, they we closed the conquest. British soldiers against us. And after the war, the, after the war, the war, Americans. after the war, the war was solved by peace treaty. Same as the war with Britain was solved by peace treaty. Right? Right? We had a treaty of peace with those we were at war with. That ended no, the war. I'm not aware there was, yeah. Yeah, there were treaties the of peace with the native peoples. There was a treaty of Holston in 1791 oh, no, no with the treaties. Cherokee people. Not one, not one treaty covered the United no, States. No, 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 of course not. With numerous nations. So what does that have to do with one treaty? The treaty means that you're dealing with a sovereign nation. It means you're dealing with another people. It means you're recognizing their right, and they're recognizing your right, and you're coming to terms. You had been in war, you had been in a situation of belligerency, and at the end of the war, you resolved that by forming, by making a peace treaty. I, I think they made a bad choice. Yeah, that, that may be. You can understand perhaps why they might have made that show choice. Up but and then demand rights after you were killing. So Britain demands rights after they're killing us. We grant Britain rights. Why don't we grant the native people's rights? They didn't have to kill American colonials. The British didn't have to kill American they, colonials either. They took bribes and, and made a conscious to they voted on it. All right. I don't I understand what your what your distinction is between, say, the Cherokee Nation and the, the English nation. What what is the grounds for that distinction? Both of them were killing Americans. They made it, the Indians made a choice. That's a separate issue. The British made a but choice. That's status, a separate issue. You know. What's the difference? That they're entitled to some rights then by by Every people on earth is entitled to rights under war, international law. They want some rights. Didn't Every people promise? on earth is entitled to rights under international law. Okay. That declare war in the United States? Even if the they Japanese? declare war in the United States. I mean, I wrote this okay. piece. I urge you to read it, Charles, on planning for the occupation of Japan during World War II. We could have chosen a vengeful policy towards Japan. We didn't. We chose to reach out to the Japanese people and seek to make allies with them, and that was the right choice. We recognize that the Japanese people had rights even though they had launched war on us. Cherokee people, Japanese people, they're human beings. They've got human rights. That's the position I'm articulating. Okay. Other questions on Next that? Next questions. Yeah. If we, uh... Yeah, one more. Okay, okay well, I, I admire uh, that you want to do the right thing. But how do you, is this actually feasible? I mean, with all the stuff that's going on and the history of people not giving a rat's ass about indigenous peoples and the horrors that they're going through on the reservations, is there any movement that's actually propelling this kind of uh, So the of movement that forward? came out of Bernie Sanders' campaign, the Our Revolution movement, has a people's agenda, and one of the items on the people's agenda is respect for tribal sovereignty. And I'm doing my best to raise the height of that issue on the agenda for the for the country. And that's what I'm, I'm going to try and do. Whether it's feasible, <coughs> I don't know. I believe that ultimately, if you don't reach for what's impossible, you're never going to get what's possible. So that's one answer to your question. Mm -hmm. But at a deeper level, I think the history of the United States is the history of people making more real that phrase, we are sovereigns without subjects. I talked about that in the beginning, right? <coughs> that it's the Civil War and the Civil Rights Movement that begins to make that true for African Americans, that it's the suffragists and the women's rights movement that begins to make it true for women, that it's the trade unions and the labor movement that begins to make it true or keep it true for working people, that we need that spirit and that kind of organization and that kind of commitment in our present day, in our present fight against the 1%. And part of that means we have to ask for ourselves what kind of conduct have we taken with regard to the native people. And I believe we have to ask for justice for them the same way we ask for justice for ourselves because it's all one piece, it's all justice. Okay. There used to be a, a group who were made of, who were composed of indigenous peoples here, who was the treaty rights.
rights group, are they still active? I don't know. I'm in touch with people at the, the center at Northwestern, uh, which is quite impressive. Um, but I'm not in touch with, I, I know of the existence of the group and, that you're referring to, but I'm not, uh, not sure if they're currently uh, organized and currently doing anything. Are you in touch with the uh, American Indian Center? The American Indian Center where? Chicago. It's on, it's Chicago. Oh, on, on um, it's uh, Foster or? No, no, no. It used to be on Wilson and Ashland and now it's on uh, Ainsley and yes. Temple. Yeah, I've been to an event there, but just once. <laughs> that doesn't sound like in touch, but that's yeah. okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, that, see, this has been debated since the 60s and 70s. And the reservation has a citizen band and then the native band. And I can't hear you. Can you speak up? There's, this has been debated since the 60s and 70s on the reservation. And there's not unanimous opinion on this that the, 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 the terms like citizen band versus the native band. Now, to pull the entire, to set up a separate government and pull the United States out entirely from the reservations, meaning you would close BIA schools, they would not be participate in Social Security, other measures such as you're advocating under Bernie. Okay, so if they're a separate nation, uh, and some little issues to me about who goes before a tribal court don't mean very much. If it's a separate nation, it's a separate nation. And it's a separate nation, but our relations would be worked out by treaty. It's, it's a matter of decolonization, and there would be a long, lengthy process of decolonization that would take place if we had the political will in the country to move in that direction. So All of these no issues would have to be worked the United, out. The United States would grant anything. There's no guarantee of anything, but we, the American people, should recognize what our intentions were at the founding and what our intentions were in our treaties with the Indian nations, and we should keep our word. We should be bound by our word. So you're talking like Ed Indrexit. Yes, there, that, 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 that actually has a certain resonance to it. <laughs> when you talk about indigenous people and the history of you know, making their um, making their society better, you have to look at, you also have to take into consideration the history of indigenous people. Like when they have to, when you have to think about like the whole, the whole immigrant, when immigration pay a part in that too, because indigenous people did own like Texas, Utah, and things like that. So wouldn't that make things like kind of complicated too with that? So, uh, things things are very complicated in this. I don't want to get in the position of suggesting that everything that the colonists brought to the New World was bad for the Native peoples. I'm not trying to make that kind of an argument. Oh no, I don't think so. I would just act like when you have to take that into consideration, like when that, when your position, when that, when it make it more difficult, considering the fact that, like when you're talking about. Um, uh, peace treaties and things of that sort, like wouldn't that make it more difficult than the fact that they did own, like, I'll say a quarter of the United States? More than that. Yeah. So they're going to get their land back? I, so this gets to a really interesting question, which is take the Black Hills of South Dakota, right? I don't know if you know the history behind this. There's a treaty in which the United States promises that that land will belong to the to Lakota people, to the Sioux, and that they can have it forever in perpetuity and will guarantee it unless there is a treaty signed by three-quarters of the adult males of the tribe saying otherwise. And within a decade of that treaty being signed, there was starvation among the Lakota people. And the United States went and said, we'll give you starvation rations if you give us your land. And they got 10%, only 10% of the Sioux adult male people to sign that treaty. And on the basis of that treaty, they stole the Black Hills. Now, should that land be returned? I think the answer to that is yes. I think the answer is that what we did is exactly analogous to what Russia did to Crimea in the Ukraine uh, just a few years ago. We stole land in violation of treaty and we're obliged to at least offer compensation. We have, in fact, offered compensation. We've been turned down. Our compensation has been laughed at. It's more than a billion dollars at this point in escrow and it's just not considered uh, in any way adequate. And I think we have a legal obligation there that should be fulfilled. 
Now, whether there are other legal obligations that are as clear as that, I don't know. That would be, again, something that would have to be worked out. Decolonization is not easy. It's, I'm not suggesting this is going to be easy for the American people to do. I'm just suggesting that it's the right thing to do. I'm suggesting that the fantasy that we've been living under, whereby all of this land is ours by power of eminent domain, and we can take it any time we want, and we can do whatever we want with it, that's just not true. It's never been true. <clears throat> Are you, are you aware of how much fiber optic cable and data centers are out in the Black Hills? That mm -hmm. it's like, and really, if they, mm -hmm. they really got a good sense for revenue out there. So then there's negotiations, and negotiations are difficult, and you find uh, common ground if you can, and you find treaties on that basis. We should reopen the treaty-making process and respect the voice and the rights of the Native peoples. Okay. If there are no more questions, Okay, are go we ahead. Going to, I'm sorry, are we going to current, uh, is it just, is we still, is it open for like regular questions? Or does it have I don't to, know the procedure right we, here. Uh, I'm, what are I'm we simply just talking about the indigenous people right now? Uh, yeah. We can open up any questions yeah, you I'll, want. I'll field any question anyone wants to ask on anything. I have a question yeah. regarding like free education. Yeah. Free college education. Yeah. Like what's your take on that? Okay, so I have two takes on this in answer to your question. This is a question on free college education. I believe that public tuition at public colleges and universities should be free, but my emphasis is on early education, especially in the first five years of life. And I put forward a proposal that we should tax short-term debt in this country, which would raise about $20 billion a year from the nine largest financial institutions alone. These are institutions that should be broken up, but even after they're broken up, the tax would still raise revenue. And on the basis of that tax, we should fund a national Montessori-style pre-K for all. So that's my priority in education, is early education, early childhood education should be made free, accessible, good Montessori-style education for everyone in the country. And that will take also time to work towards. Uh, but that's, that's the highest priority in education, public education that I am advocating. Oh, um, not college? Yeah, I would, I would advocate for college too, but I'm saying if you, if you force me to choose, what I really care most about at this point is the early childhood education. But I care about both. Oh, okay. Okay. <coughs> How are you going to pay for all the social benefits you're proposing? Okay, so here, here's a question for you. I, I'd like to get people's sense of this. In Denmark, the country collects 51% of the national income of the country goes to taxes, but Denmark provides free tuition, provides free health care, provides free child care, provides guaranteed paid family and medical leave for a year for both moms and dads. Would you be willing to see your taxes increased in order to see real benefits increased? What do you, what do you say? Tax the 1%. Yeah. Uh, so tax the 1%, yes, but I'm saying more than that. Tax not just the 1%, but tax everybody in the country. If you get from that a series of really worthwhile benefits the way you have in Denmark, in Sweden, in Germany, in most of, uh, of Europe. But even they have other cover problems that we've made oh, about. Oh, absolutely. They're, they're, there's no way of getting rid of problems in this world. I, I gave a talk to the Chicago Literary Club in October on America and the Kingdom of God, which is on my webpage. And you'll see I come out of a religious tradition, and I believe there's no way of getting out of, out of problems in this world. I think of, uh, I mean, I don't mean to impose my religious faith on anybody, but I look at the cross as an indictment of all power that doesn't proceed from love, and I think that means all political power in this world, bar none. Okay. We're all under indictment, and we all need to do better. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's amazing that uh, a poor Latin American country like Argentina have free medical care mm -hmm. and free education, university, all of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and here they're still debating whether that is possible or not. I mean, the, the thing is that uh, people that have power here are religious and they believe in some other power down there. And uh, it's, it's just bullshit. To well, I'm, I'm, the really, I'm religious. I believe in some of their power down there or whatever, but that doesn't stop well, me from being a social democrat. Well, I don't know. If you believe in uh, Guru Guru, then it's your problem. But the point is that this country is so blind to what is obvious to the whole world. I, I agree with that. And the reason why we're so blind is because we on the left have failed to articulate from first principles. We failed to go back to the basic justice of the situation. We failed to go back to Abraham Lincoln's quote that I gave you earlier about the legitimate purpose of government. And we bought into Ronald Reagan's quote that government is the problem. That's the, that's the real problem. I, I, I think this is just a principle of interpretation. 
But I think fundamentally, when you lose, you can either blame somebody else, or you can blame yourself and look at what you did that helped to make matters worse. And we on the left have to look at what we have failed to do to advocate for first principles for what should be done in this country. Yeah, another one over here. Um, what okay. What are your thoughts on gun control? Okay, so I think guns should be at least as strictly regulated as cars. All right? That means I think people should have to take a test and pass a test and do so repeatedly and buy insurance. I think there should be civil penalties attached in the law to any time a gun is used for a criminal purpose, whether you own the gun or not. So let's say you own a gun and somebody steals it. There should be a penalty on you because you were careless and your gun was stolen. And if it's used in the commission of a crime, there should be a penalty and your insurance should have to cover that. And that insurance premium would serve to deter a lot of misuse of guns. It would sure serve to make people more careful of their guns. It would serve as would the training and the exams that people would have to pass. It would serve to begin to try and deal with this horrible set of deaths in this country that come from a crazy gun culture. If I had my way, I would go the Australian route and actually ban them. But in, in practice, I don't think it's possible in the political context of this country to ban guns. Too many people have too much invested in them. But I think at least we can regulate them and regulate them the way we regulate automobiles. No guns in public. So no guns in public places. At, at, at a minimum, we can do things like that. Yes. So basically, you're talking about getting what liability laws would be like, say, a ladder or something else, into the gun, into the gun. Into the gun in the industry. Yes, I am. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, would you be uh, open to the idea of, let's say, reforming uh, marijuana laws, like uh, yes. so that they're not. Uh, a Schedule One drug, the same yes, as heroin. Yes, absolutely, heroine. absolutely. It's absurd that marijuana should be considered a drug like heroin. Legalization? That's, that's easy. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have any problem with legalization. All right. I would tax it. I would regulate it the same way I regulate cigarettes and uh, cigarettes and alcohol. I'd have heavy sin taxes on it. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? If not, let's get into our rebuttal period. Let's thank our speaker. You'll get the last word. We've got plenty of rebuttal time. We'll go about four minutes each. And uh, let's get started. It's an open mic. we got rebuttals to start. All right, Jonathan. Go, Jonathan. Go, start us off. Somebody has to break the ice. Yes. Will you really want another Jonathan rebuttal the first no. time up? Yeah. Yes. Yes. There's a lot of people I haven't seen in a long time. Who wants to speak first? You, you speak you. first. Okay. All right. Don't say I didn't try. Just. Don't say I didn't try. Uh, thank you to our speaker. Uh, excellent presentation. Our uh, military in the United States of America currently gets 60% of our budget. And at the Q&A session, uh, I asked about our taxes because it's very interesting how we don't realize our power in this country uh, to hold the government accountable for responsibly allocating our values into the budget every annual year. So I like what I'm hearing about military overspending, ludicrous spending, crazy extinction of spending being severely reduced. I like that a lot. So I'll just start that off with the bat of saying you knocked it out of the park with that one. Uh, we have a surveillance ring in this country that is now currently 5 to 10 percent. That will definitely increase under people like Rex Tillerson and Jeff Sessions. So I don't remember exactly, somebody can correct me, but it sounded like we were in agreement uh, with tonight's speaker's policy proposal that we shouldn't have a police state, we should actually have a country where privacy and journalism are good things and not bad things. So I like that. I like uh, grassroots organizing and grassroots activism, so I'm, I'm with you on that. I like the fact that you talked about how uh, the First Nation peoples have to be acknowledged as people and not as subjects or slaves or servants. So that is long overdue reparations for First Nations people. Um, fossil fuel mongers need to be uh, held accountable for destroying the air, land, and water in the United States. So that was impressive. Um, I don't know, did you mention anything about uh, libraries? 
Did you mention anything about libraries? Yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about libraries then for a couple seconds. Uh, I think you can tell how democratic, how civilized, and how uh, enlightened the community is by how much we invest in libraries, because that's something that you can have a lifetime continuing educational process in, whether you go to college or community college or not. So I, I would like to see uh, more of your policy platform talk about uh, community funding to increase libraries, because we know we have a lot of politicians in Illinois, I won't name their name, who recently tried in the last decade to reduce library funding. How many minutes do we have tonight? Three or four? Four. Is it four or four? Okay. All right. Um, one thing that uh, is very interesting, I don't have time to read it tonight, but it's an article by Roger Hall in Z Magazine. So you can duck, duck, go it. Don't Google it. Duck, duck, go it. Uh, it's called, It's a Time for a New Contract with America. And that's what I like about your... Uh, Candace, you're talking about a contract with America and not as Newt Gingrich and the uh, extinctionist revolution, a contract on America's back. So I'm very pleased that you were here this evening and good luck on your candidacy. Thank you. of what you're into. Uh, I don't know Indian affairs too well. Uh, indigenous uh, Americans too well. Although I don't know if they're making money on casinos and fracking. That's what I heard. Anyway, um, good to hear that we have somebody who wants to tax Wall Street, the casino. So, I know it's real big news. I hope to do a speech on it here, a PowerPoint, uh, for uh, if Charlie you know approves it, blesses it, you know, and uh, explain uh, you know how we're being, uh, how it's rigged, and how we're being fooled, and how big media tells us that the Dow Jones Industrial Average is an indicator of the economy, and I'll which it's not. I'll debate you on that. Oh, you bet you will. And you're going to be wrong. <laughs> you'll be wrong. <laughs> so, A challenge again, here, my friend. What? A challenge. Yes. Uh, yeah, so don't be fooled by the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's just the casino economy. And let me remind you all, all that uh, the 1% and Wall Street love monopolies, they love low wages, they love globalization because it competes with American workers. They love no protections, they love no regulations on their companies. They're anti-environment, they are for mergers and acquisitions because then they can monopolize and fire a lot of people. This is one Wall Street who I'm talking about, the Dow Jones Industrial, the, the rig that Dow Jones Industrial Average. They're in favor of no benefits. They, they're happy when people have no benefits. They're happy when people have no medical care. They're pro-tax breaks. Thank you, Mr. Trump. <laughs> they're pro-bailouts. Thank you, Barack Obama, you limousine liberal. They're in favor of wars. Lots of money to be made in wars for Wall Street and the one percent. They're anti-infrastructure. They're anti-transportation. Wall Street. They want you burning oil. They want you watching TV. They want you on the internet. They don't want you transporting environmentally friendly ways. And Charlie, Wall Street, the one percent are very very anti-union. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next. Sid. 
Did I put it over oh, I agree. Who are you? With the no. uh, huh? Oh, my name is Senator. I agree with what Roosevelt did in the 1930s and 1940s with the New Deal. But the trouble is, even with the New Deal, and even with Roosevelt in there, we still had a lot of monopolies oppressing Latin America and oppressing the Philippines and taking over Hawaii. So we were still an imperialist nation at that point. And in 1898, remember the Maine, that was our first adventure in imperialism, where we took over all these countries. I mean, under the New Deal, they put a, Roosevelt put a tax during the war on the big corporations and the banks. They had to pay 90% of their earnings for the war. But they still made out like bandits, nevertheless. When the war was over, you had the Marshall Plan. It was good in some ways. But it was bad in other ways, and that is the Marshall Plan would have done it allowed American corporations to get into Europe. And American corporations made a bundle under the Marshall Plan. When you have capitalism, monopolies are not artificial. Monopolies are inherent in the very nature of capitalism. And when you have monopolies, you have imperialism. Because monopolies have to have vast amounts of raw materials. They have to have, they have, they have, to have huge markets because they produce so much wealth and so much profit. And you had also a way of getting cheap labor, and that was completely different than colonialism. In colonialism, they took taxes and they took other things that was a benefit, like maybe wheat or uh, some other things of that nature. So uh, monopolies, like I said, is inherent in capitalism. Uh, and as long as you have monopolies, you have people with just tremendous wealth, they're able to buy off any politician. And you see uh, what's happening with the Republican Party, it has moved tremendously to the right. There's been a qualitative change where it's become a fascist party right now. And the Democrats, under Clinton, what they call triage, also made big, big movements in the Democratic Party as moving to the right. Like Obama got in, and people thought, well, Obama must be regressive. Why? Because he had a black skin. That doesn't make it progressive. What makes it progressive is your policies, and he just carried out the same policies as Clinton and the other uh, presidents uh, during this monopoly stage of capitalism at this time. So in order to solve the problem, we have to go far ahead of social democracy, where the people themselves use the profits for themselves instead of giving it to somebody who hasn't earned it and sits on Wall Street and gets uh, dividends and doesn't do a damn thing and he's nothing but a parasite. And the capitalism itself is parasitical. Under capitalism you might work two hours a day for yourself, but where does the other 80% goes? 
It goes into the bankers and the capitalist hands. So it's a form of slavery, what Marx called wage slavery, and we have to go beyond that. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I appreciate most of your positions. I really wish you would not throw women under the bus, like most, because you were talking about supporting, expanding the, um, the umbrella and supporting candidates like Lipinski, who's um, anti-women, among a lot of other things. So um, I don't think that women are going to stand for that this time around. So I think if you take, if the Democratic Party takes that attitude, they're going to get some significant pushback. Uh, and I guess that um, I, I, I realize that a lot of, of what people have to talk about is being pragmatic rather than being idealistic. And so that's sad. Anyway, um, or at least for me. Uh, and then um, the, the other thing I wanted to say is about um, indigenous peoples here. American Indians have really gotten the raw end of the deal um, for the last 600 years or so. And, um, and so, or 500 and whatever. And, um, and it's nice that someone is actually bringing out some kind of, of a constructive critique of this. You know, it's kind of funny that we're talking about these same problems with human rights today as we did back in 1776. That's because we're the same assholes. <laughs> no, maybe it might be human nature in a lot of ways, but the thing, the thing is, is that I've been rereading some famous book about by Adam Smith. It's called The Wealth of Nations. And it's a really good book, but he did go on to write a first book, which was, the I think, called the, somebody up here, The Principles of Human Behavior. The Theory of Moral Sentiments. The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it's been amazing to me how much he knew about capitalism, about the wealth of nations, and about what he called rampant mercantilism as exhibited by the East India Tea Company and how influential he was in the formation of our government by the principles that he had articulated back in 1776. Smith's main premise in writing these books were how to elevate the poor into a mainstream economic system. And he basically had told us that if the poor could, if, if you left people alone to their own basic devices and let government just protect basic rights and then leave them alone to prosper, they would generally find a way. Now, I'm not saying that we get rid of things like health care or something else because there has been some studies recently on the guaranteed income where you provide people basic rent, food, and uh, health, and then leave them alone to prosper. You know, I could live with that kind of form of government. Um, and I know that the problem of poverty is a very big one that needs to be solved. And I think sometimes that having a, maybe a guaranteed basic minimum type of standard of living might be one of the ways we ought to consider it because from what some of the studies I've seen, and this is a radical departure for me because, you know, I'm basically a Republican. I, I believe in a man should work, and I believe in the dignity of work. I believe in the dignity of, of life. But, you know, the evidence might become a little more clear that sometimes maybe the best way is direct benefits to the people. Even Ronald Reagan, back in his 1964 speech, said, uh, you know, when the welfare state was going strong, he said, uh, there was enough money in there that if we took out all the administrative overhead that government had done, we could send every one of those people to Harvard. 
maybe there was a little bit more overhead there than re what you realize. The thing is, with government benefits, there's usually a lot of strings attached, and that raises administrative costs quite a bit. We could, as a country, perhaps maybe do this guaranteed income thing and still eliminate a lot of problems that we may have with work, with things like this. And in a lot of cases, it might be something to consider. But I'm still of the opinion that the best way to bring any, any people out of poverty is through free market capitalism. It's worked. We've globalized in 300 years. Wall Street has been a tremendous economic engine when it's ran on a straight and narrow. Because I do know that there are several issuances of stock on certain companies that I've been at. They've been tremendously helpful. So I'm not going to talk about, you see, what you're referring to, Mike, is the misuse of capitalism, not the benefits thereof. Yes, you may have evil dictatorials on Wall Street, but you also have a lot of good people doing a lot of good things, like bringing the internet out, capital projects, things like this. So I'm not going to sit here and condemn Wall Street. That was Main Street, for the young of heart in here, I will only recommend. He's had 30 books on But it's about that. Okay, are you through? <laughs> <laughs> to you. Uh, I, I want to recommend, highly recommend, that you read two books Anna Karenina and War and Peace. If you read those, these two books, you will be yeah. prepared to see uh, things that otherwise they, they pass like invisible to our, to our common life. Uh, I read it when I was 18 years old, and I think it changed my life. Uh, I am not an you know, uh, exception in any way, but I didn't in, involve in any violence. I was really very peaceful in my dealing with different people, different circumstances. So that was my, my, my main thing. Everybody, especially young people, read Anna Karenina and War and Peace. You will enjoy it. I will teach you. <laughs> I found it boring. Yeah. <laughs> love story. Uh, I happen to have an interest in Native American problems, partly because I was mostly raised in the Southwest, and um, the Native Americans were very uh, evident there. I think more so than here or in the, the at back east, but I could be wrong about that. But um, uh, you know I'm a board member of the Nuclear Energy Information Service, and um, we supported a, a, a film called Crying Earth Rise Up. And that film is about the, the people who are living under uh, the radiation in the Southwest, uh, mostly from mining and uh, milling and uh, spilling of uh, uh, mill tailings uh, onto the land and of the people who are trying to um, raise their children and uh, avoid radiation. Uh, the, the, the movie features a little girl who was born with no anus and uh, a bad kid, one bad kidney. Uh, the other kidney wasn't even there. And um, anyway, uh, it, the, the movie ends with her family displacing themselves so they could spend long hours while she was hospitalized and uh, had her body um, tried to try to put her body in the same shape as it should have been and in the end you see her running around the playground with other children playing and 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 then you find out that after the movie was completed and released the little girl died she just couldn't uh, but she did live to be nine or ten and uh, you know, the Native Americans in the Southwest have a saying, 
you may run into an old coal miner, but you'll never run into an old uranium miner. Um, so uh, I, I uh, have a lot of feelings about what has happened to the Native Americans when their lands are taken over. And there's a guy in Illinois called Shimkus. Uh, I think his first name is Robert, but I could be wrong. And he has introduced a bill into the national legislature called 5053. This bill would put money into restoring Yucca Mountain, and it would uh, put a lot of money into the transportation of nuclear materials. Um, and I'm talking about high-level radioactive waste, which is extremely dangerous. And the barging that uh, Mr. I wrote your name down. It's uh, Schwartzberg. Uh, yeah, the barging that Mr. Schwartzberg talked about is a huge danger. We're right here on the lake, and the the, the high-level nuclear waste from uh, Big Rock Point and um, Palisades, Cook, uh, Zion, um, Three Rivers, uh, I know that's not the name, but Kiwani, uh, all of those nuclear plants are producing high-level nuclear waste, and uh, the only way to get it where, where, where the Bill 3053 says it's supposed to go is to barge it, and um, it's a terrible, terrible idea. If one of those casks fell into the lake, you know, water slows down neutrons, and that would be a big disaster because then the neutrons would hit other atoms inside the cask and build up uh, heat so, so that there could be a nuclear explosion. Uh, it's, it's a very, very complicated problem. And not only that, the train, train uh, the trains that would be transmitting high-level nuclear waste, uh, you know, they all go through Chicago. And, uh, and even in Shimkus's own district, there would be a lot of transportation of high-level nuclear waste if you were going to try to get everything over to Nevada's Yucca Mountain. Uh, okay, uh, that was just the first thing I wrote down here. Damn. Okay. Um, so, I wanted to also talk about the difference between integration and equality, and um, other things like that. There's a young woman, Andrew, uh, Amara Enya, and um, she doesn't. Uh, uh, she's written a, an op-ed in the Tribune, but her whole thing, and which I believe in, is that we're not going to solve problems by pushing integration. People will get, are going to associate what they want to associate with, and the only thing to do is to have equality of uh, what she called um, equity. Equity in resources and uses. Um, I have nothing to rebut, <laughs> but uh, I did want to add something that I thought it was important. Uh, I recommend a book that I really enjoyed by an author named Jared Diamond called Jun Guns, Germs, and Steel. Oh, yeah. And uh, he, um, and one of his basic premises is that, uh, uh, is that indigenous peoples are not dumb because they don't have, uh, they don't have stuff. Um, he had a friend in Borneo who said, how come you have everything we have nothing? And that started him on this path to write this book. And uh, I hope I don't do him a disservice, but the way, what I got from the book is that basically well, you had uh, humans develop in Africa, the cradle of humanity, and they started migrating. But at some point in the Fertile Crescent, uh, they had unique plants and animals that were, uh, that allowed them to domesticate uh, things like grains like wheat, barley, and uh, cattle, pigs, sheep, was all in the Fertile Crescent. And so what happened is that those people ended up specializing. And that was the key to the advancements in civilization. And that movement led into Europe, um, while peoples in Asia, Australia, Africa, and the Americas really didn't develop specialization. So it's not that the, uh, the indigenous peoples are ignorant. They're highly intelligent. Uh, they just haven't specialized. They haven't advanced uh, 
uh, as uh, uh, industrially. Uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, the story about the pilgrims, that these people came over from England and uh, settled here, met, this, met the Indians, called them savages. You aren't advanced. You're not, you know, living in the dirt. You're wearing animal skins. You don't have any tool, real tools. You don't have metals. And uh, until the winter hit, and the settlers started dropping like flies. They didn't have food. They were dying of starvation, disease. And the Indians were just warm, had no problems feeding themselves. And they're looking at the Europeans going, who are those people? Idiots. So it, it's all culturally based. Intelligence is culturally based. And we don't appreciate that from the hunter-gatherers who were who are the indigenous, the original indigenous people of these countries. I'm, I'm not sure if people realize um, the, the horrors that, the, that these uh, people suffer on uh, reservations. Does anybody here know what the, the average unemployment rate is on, uh, on the Indian reservations? 80 to 90%. 80 to 90%? 80 to 90%? Yes, I read 90%. Can you imagine? trying to thrive or just survive in a community where unemployment is 90%. It's unimaginable. And of course, they're also genetically disposed for um, alcoholism. So they have to battle a high level of alcoholism, as would any community that suffered from high unemployment would have to battle. Can I ask a question? What? I'm from Europe. You know, I just tried to educate myself. <laughs> So then how they... How I tell they, you what, let me finish my talk. Are they in public? They can go on public aid, they receive some assistance? Those I, I bet the speaker would be able to better address that, but I'm, I wouldn't know about that. I just read a lot, so I pick up these, these things, but I haven't read about the public aid issue on reservations. But I have read that there is very little police patrol, and they have a huge problem with women being sexually assaulted and women disappearing on reservations. Um, in fact, they just made, there was a movie released last year about it, Wind River, I think. So uh, these people are, are really suffering. We, we, we have, the indigenous people of this country is just a very, very shameful stain on the history of this country. And um, um, I think a lot of them would think that moving to the south side of Chicago would be a vacation for them. So, uh, I just wanted to point that out. Thanks. Thank you. Who's next? Next rebuttal? Charlie, get up there. Get up, boys, Charlie. Get up there, Charlie. Me already? Yes. And I'm still working on it. All right, but I'll uh, never get you guys going. You guys are putting me to sleep here. You never say anything anyway. All right, so what's thank the you very much. Let's thank our speaker. And let's thank Tim. And maybe next week you'll remember to bring the sacred banner. <laughs> well, it's more than I mean, he records these for videos. And one guy remarked, he said, I look like a bartender. <laughs> no, it's Normally the thing, but it doesn't show up that much. I'll be eclectic as usual here. Thank you and good luck on your campaign. Uh, thank you for running and demonstration of good citizenship. Whatever the results are, you know, our society benefits through the discussion of the issues here. First of all, I got to get this thing, this Indian thing out of the way. I began life uh, by working on a, uh, an Indian reservation uh, for a couple of years. Um, so I don't, I don't remember all this Indian issues. Uh, later on, I represented the employees of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and did their personal policies and practices and things like that. Actually, I ended up with an Eskimo girlfriend on it. That gig, but <laughs> which was rather unusual. But no, I worked with them there. Actually, I'm, I was thinking the other day too. Oddly enough, I watched this movie. Um, I had spoken about this in a PowerPoint pres presentation. Uh, they have these Turner Classic movies, and they have drums along the Mohawk. Uh, 
which has a lot of stereotypical uh, information. And actually, there's some things about that movie that are accurate, too. Uh, so, uh, but there, like anything in Hollywood's portrayal of the Indians, um, might not be uh, what some people think. Uh, the issue of, it, it was my understanding there were two divisions among the Native Americans on the reservation. There's the citizen band and the tribal band. And basically it stems from years ago when they could choose citizenship and receive real estate. Uh, 200 acres to 50 acres per uh, adult. And the issue has been cooking ever since. Um, it, and there's differences of opinion. There's, there's not even agreement on who's, who's in the tribes. Um, it boils over today. A lot of you remembered Leonard Peltier was actually on one side of the issue. He was in the tribal band. Um, and obviously it had tragic consequences because uh, from the, the other side. Uh, so I'm, you know, and I'll be honest with you, I have had a book on among my, I still keep up with it. I go to the Gathering of Nations uh, and go to Gallup, New Mexico, the Indian capital for things. but. Um, I'll be quite candid with you, my book on this topic has been sitting there for a number of years and I've never read it because I, I, how they resolve it. I mean, you can say, well, let's pull the government out and let's be all on our own. Well, you know, one, the one way you can tell you're on an Indian reservation, you want to know how you can tell you're on an Indian reservation as opposed to the rest of the state, like Nebraska against, there's no faith road. So that's what you're going to end up with. You're going to shut down the BIA schools, you know, things of that nature. I don't know the details of it like that to say, well, this is going to be worked out and arrangements will be worked out later. Sure. I don't know what you're gaining by, by doing it. Uh, because it's relations perfect? No. The history of the real estate, we all know the history of the United States is the history of real estate. So that's out of the way, and they, they were out to get land, especially in the early 19th century. All right, let's see, what else have I got here? 20 seconds. Uh, 20 seconds, that's it. Uh, actually, maybe you could talk a little bit more about your carbonizing, um, de decarbonizing the society. That struck my interest. Um, and we have some green officers here in the sure. college here. Um, that's the one that particularly would affect us right now, uh, global warming and things of that nature, climate issues and green issues. Anyhow, thanks again, Stephen. Good luck on your campaign. All right. Keep coming out of here. He's really, just like the Indians, he's throwing me out of my land. He's throwing me out. Yeah, he's taking my audio. I do thank our speaker for tonight. Um, whether or not you win or lose a campaign like this, uh, there's a lot of others that are doing the same thing you're doing. It's a progressive movement that Bernie started. Not everybody may get elected, some will, some won't, but we have to keep entering the races and keep talking about just the fact that you're entering the race, talking about these issues is what's important. Um, Buck Mr. Fuller, our Buck Mr. Fuller, wrote a book called The Grunch of Giants. That's Grunch stands for Gross Universal Cash Heist. He's talk, he referred to Grunch as what we refer to now as the oil companies, the billionaires, Exxon, Mobil, uh, the trillion dollar, multi-trillion dollar industries that have their tentacles wrapped around the planet. Um, he said the human race has to choose between running an industry that produces things for living or running a massive industry that produces things for killing people. And the, the, the United States military is the largest killing machine on the planet. It's not defending us in any way, shape, or form anywhere in the world. Those of you that don't know what the drones are doing, because the media doesn't tell us, the drones have only one purpose, to kill 
innocent people and create hatred, pockets of new terrorists, so that we can keep saying there's terrorists around the world and we have to keep the trillion dollar military juggernaut going in 140 countries. That's one thing. A great poisonous tree was planted in this country, and a lot of the problems that we've been talking about are like leaves and branches on that tree. Well, you can't keep going after one leaf at a time while the tree is sprouting other ones. You have to go after the roots. And that poisonous tree was the myth of 9-11 that was planted on September 11th. It was the greatest. For those of you that can't face reality, I would highly recommend what Professor Griffin talks about. There's a fraction, 30 over 7. You do not need an open mind to understand any of this stuff. You need a 30% open mind and a 7th grade education. That's how easy the forensic evidence is to understand. There's no debate now on what happened on 9-11. Seven buildings were leveled by explosives. The media filmed the first two, and they sold it as a, an attack by crazed Muslims. There was no Muslims involved in the attack on 9-11. It was a totally inside job done by Americans and some people, high-ranking Israeli officials that have dual citizenship there in our government. It was a dual Israeli-American uh, false flag operation to start the war to take over oil and resources in seven countries in the Middle East and just reshape it. We have to face the reality of what our billionaire predators are doing. As John McMurtry wrote in 1999, a Canadian author, he published a book called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. He said if you allow predators that have no ethics, morals, and conscience, you allow them to mass enough money that they rise to the top and become billionaires, they will eat everything in sight and destroy a country. Right now we have billionaire predators and their highly paid intellectual prostitutes masquerading as our Congress critters in the Republican Party running this country. We don't have politicians in the Republican Party. You've got a massive number of intellectual prostitutes that are told by their billionaire owners, you pass these laws, uh, you deny global warming, you do this, 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 or we will remove you from office in the next cycle or you could get killed. So, you know, there's a tremendous amount of fear among the Republicans that uh, are under the gun to do things for the billionaire predators. And some people laugh about these things because they're unaware of the reality of what's going on. That's why I say uh, start logging onto the website called Common Dreams. Common Dreams, Truth Out of the Smirking Chimp, those are three of the best sites with political analysts people that have 30, 40 years credibility writing books, reality-based things, uh, you'll have a much better picture of what's going on. I work, uh, I coach 7th and 8th graders in science as a volunteer. We, the 8th graders are they're, they're going home and teaching their mom and dad a fraction, 10,000 to 1. 10,000 times more light falls on the planet every day than what the human race uses as energy. We collect one ten thousandth of that with cheap solar panels, and we don't need any coal, oil, gas, or new nuclear power plants that are now 20 times more expensive than solar right now. And the price of solar and efficiency and everything else is dropping. You can build homes without furnaces now. They can be run off the light that falls on the roof and the siding. And that stuff has been around since 1979. So um, one last thing, the Mayans, they, they left us with a prophecy where they said when one 20,000, 26,000 year cycle ends, Coming out of that cycle, as end of December in 2012, you get a decade, about 10 years of fantastic change. It can go either way. It's going to be a fight between good and evil, as the Mayans said. It's a fight for the soul of humanity, and that's what we're seeing. A great evil has descended over our country in the form of our political, the people that are running the country right now. And the Republican Party especially, and a lot of other the Republican governors in these blue states, they're showing basically no ethics, no morals, right. and no conscience. And we have to speak the proper truth. Uh, you, you can't be uh, debating whether this is right or wrong when it's obviously wrong. Yeah, you know, like our, our it's Stephen, is it Steve? Steve. As Steve said, um, there's good people running. The same, you know, the Bernie Sanders revolution has started. Steve is just one of hundreds of people all over the country trying to displace our political criminals that are masquerading as our elected officials in many states. The Supreme Court 
Citizens United decision opened the floodgates and said billionaires can buy and sell and own our politicians. You don't no longer have to bribe them anymore. You can just own them, and then they'll they'll do your bidding. So we have to face that single reality and start to pull the country out of it. And there's beneficial solutions and groups working for good stuff all over the country. Just like Steve here, you you know about Bernie's revolution. Are you in contact with some of these other people? There was about a month ago. There was a progressive wave of people that got elected on the Tuesday elections. Right, well, that was about a month ago, wasn't it? Uh, nationwide, and it surprised it surprised everybody about how fast the country is waking up. Bernie Sanders is the most popular politician in the country in Trump territory now, all over the country. So let's keep supporting people that are trying to do uh, good work. Charlie, you got a quick question? What's what's going to happen in 2022? Well, in 2022, we'll know. Uh, we'll, we have less than five years. Uh, if the, the, client, the climate scientists, for those of you that didn't know, they put out a new report, 15,000 scientists. They put out an updated report from 1992, 25th anniversary update, and they said, we admit it now, our models about climate change were wrong. We've been wrong every year, absolutely wrong, because every year the models get updated and they find out climate change, global warming, the ice melting is happening faster than they thought. Next year, they'll revise it again and say, each year you get better and better and better numbers. We don't have five years to mess around with this. We let Trump and the billionaires, oil companies, run it for another five years, and it's over for the grandkids. They're going to be living on a different planet by 2050. That's how fast it's happening. We don't have another five years, ten years to mess around with this. And the U.S. military, for those of you who don't know, the U.S. military re recognizes now that the common sense generals climate change and uh, the damage to our cities is the number one threat to America. Not Al-Qaeda or terrorism or anything else. That's all a pumped up myth. So if anybody wants any more information, uh, see me. I'm going to give a speech on this, uh, an update of the latest information on April 7th. Charlie's going to uh, I'll have a write-up on it, but we're going to be talking about where we are and what the solutions are. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you everyone for coming tonight. I'm grateful to you for your interest. Uh, I don't think I'm going to take time for much of a rebuttal. I'd like to talk to each of you individually if you want to talk to me about any particular issues. But I would like to address one basic point about uh, that Charlie raised about the Bureau of Indian Affairs and its schools. Uh, the history of American imperialism is a mixed history. It goes way back. It goes back to our first effort to promote democracy among the Cherokee people in the immediate aftermath of peace treaty that we signed with them in 1791. There are times in our history when the imperial presence of the United States has done more good than harm in the world. I wrote a book on American policy toward Latin America during the Truman years, and I stressed the alliances that emerged in the 1940s between social democratic and democratic socialist movements in Latin America in the 40s and the American government. There were some. There were some times where the United States, as I say, did more good than harm. So I'm willing to grant the possibility that at least some of the time American efforts to quote unquote help the native peoples have done more good than harm. But in general, those efforts can only succeed if there's respect for the national autonomy, the national sovereignty of the peoples in question. To try and dictate to another people what will help them in a benevolent fashion, well that gets you to the war in Iraq and the consequences of the war in Iraq. It's just not the path that we should have ever been on with the American Indian nations. It's not the path we should be on with them now. Thank you. Okay. Gavel us out, Andy. Gavel us out, Andy. You got a gavel down by the side of you there. I want to know about the We'll line use the gavel. official. Is there there anybody it? else with a rebuttal, or is that as I guess we're going to. We'll uh, gavel it out yeah. for tonight, and we will hopefully see you all next week. We're adjourned. I'm hitting my hairbrush. I didn't know you had a gavel. I'll be right back.